and lo, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their nets were breaking. The fishermen's dream since the beginning of time. But today, as more and more fishermen pursue that dream further and further afield, they could find themselves making the sort of catch that nobody wants, a submarine cable. The submarine cable has been the mainstay of international communication for over a hundred years. The first cables could carry telegraph messages only. From the outset, they were both stable and reliable. But they had severe limitations, both by the number of messages they could carry simultaneously and by their inability to carry direct speech. If we attempted to carry the present-day volume of traffic by telegraph alone, there'd be almost as much cable as ocean. In 1956, telegraph was overtaken by the laying of the first transatlantic telephone cable. It could only carry 30 telephone conversations, but virtually overnight, it brought the world that much closer together. Today, the submarine cable is still the most essential individual part of a worldwide system which needs to use every means of communication available to it. Microwave, shortwave radio, and more recently, satellite. Each is complementary to the other. But the submarine cable is still technically the most stable, economically the most viable means of communication we have. But there is a catch. There is always a catch. The one catch that nobody wants. That's one reason why cable routes are planned well in advance, planned to avoid known fishing grounds. And if some fishing grounds are likely to spread, we try to plan for that eventuality too. They also have to be planned to find the easiest route through rough mountainous terrain, which could be anything up to 18,000 feet underwater. And that's difficult enough even on the continental shelf, where we have sonar to help us. Sonar is a sort of underwater radar. The sonar fish is hung over the side and trailed along the course of the proposed cable route scanning the contours of the sea floor. Every six minutes, a plot is made, a navigational fix taken, and recorded against the echo soundings and against the bottom profile picture. Eventually, these plots are transferred onto the cable chart so that we can build up an accurate picture of where the cable is going to lay and so ensure that it will lay snug on the bottom. In areas of heavy fishing activity, we can sometimes bury the cable in the sea floor. It involves dragging a large underwater plow along the bottom. This plow digs a trench, lays the cable into it, and buries it. It's a slow, complex operation. But if it succeeds in protecting the cable from trawler damage, it becomes eminently worthwhile. So where a cable can be buried, we bury it. But it's not always possible. In heavy tidal areas, where the contours of the sea floor are constantly changing, a cable buried one day would become a tripwire the next. Even where we have buried our cables, people have already begun to dig them up. The vast majority of submarine cables are laid conventionally but the speed and accuracy with which they are put down is constantly improving. So is the machinery that lays them. But the greatest improvements have taken place in the cables themselves.
whole new technology has grown around the design and construction of cables. In 25 years, cable capacity has been increased a hundred times over. This one cable will carry official information of the highest priority. 310, mark decimal 84. It will carry international computer traffic, transmit news pictures and stories. All this in addition to ordinary telephone calls. The enormous improvement in cable capacity is due to a large extent to the technical advances built into the repeaters, the electronic boosters that are spliced into the cable at regular intervals. The greater the capacity of the cable, the shorter the distance between repeaters. And each repeater adds to the overall cost of the cable. And if we're going to need a lot more cables, we are also going to need a lot more repeaters, because the volume of intercontinental telephone traffic is expected to increase by 25% for each of the next 20 years. Already there are around 100,000 miles of cable beneath the Earth's oceans, most of it in deep water. But most cable damage occurs in shallow water, where fishing activity is heaviest. That's why all shallow water cable is armoured, and sometimes double armoured, with a casing of steel wires. By adding armouring, the overall thickness of a cable is nearly doubled. So is the cost. What we get for our money is a cable with a breaking strain of more than 15 tons. And yet, it's always the armoured cables which get broken. And that, regrettably, is true the world over. In many places, there are cable systems which are armoured throughout, because the whole length of the cable lies in shallow water, which means it's almost certain to be in someone's fishing grounds or even in everyone's fishing grounds. go to sea for one reason and one reason only, to catch fish. That's their job. And any job that provides food for the world's growing population is obviously important. So the skipper's first priority is the catching of fish. And in the excitement of locating good fish, the location of a submarine cable can too easily be forgotten. Until it's too late. The skipper checks his charts, something he should have done before he put down his nets. All it does for him now is to confirm that he's hooked into a submarine cable. It's a nasty dilemma, and he really needs for time to stand still while he works out his options. He can go astern and try to disengage, or he can go full ahead and break the cable. Either way, he risks damaging his gear, or he can save the cable by slipping his gear and claiming compensation under the terms of the Paris Convention. That's what he should do, of course. But will he? Whatever he does, he'll lose valuable time. 
especially if he's on fish. Too late now to wish that he'd paid more attention to those warning leaflets showered on him by the cable patrol plane. Too late to wish he'd never gone near the cable in the first place. Now he's got a decision on his hands. A decision that could affect not just one phone call, but thousands. I'm sorry you've been cut off. I'm sorry you've been cut off. I'll try and I'm sorry you've been cut off. Hello, my friends. It looks as if we've lost tap one. We'd like to bring up the neutral aid. The first problem when a cable system is damaged is to reroute the traffic, which in turn causes overloading and delays on other routes. International here, regarding your call to Tobago, there is now up to five hours delay because of cable. International we'll service keep your here, delay. regarding your call to the USA, I'm sorry there's now a three hour delay due to a cable port. Meanwhile, the Shaw Terminal Station is trying to establish the exact location of the break. By sending electronic pulses down the cable and balancing them against each repeater in turn, they can pinpoint the break to within half a mile. There is a whole fleet of cable ships standing by at strategic points on the world's cable routes, ready to deal with just such an emergency. On this occasion, it's the cable ship Alert, covering the vital North Atlantic cable routes out of St. John's, Newfoundland. Pull ahead two engines, pull ahead two, sir. Dear 060. From St. John's, the alert is rarely more than 24 hours from a damaged cable. But in spring, the same can often be said of polar ice fields drifting south. If the ice closes in, a damaged cable could be out of action for a week. Sounding, please. 640 fathoms, sir. We're approaching the grappling position, sir. We're just on the line, two and a half knots, 640 fathoms. That looks okay. Stop engines, please. Stop engines, sir. Stand by to load away forward. 640 fathoms, the depth is 640 fathoms, and I want 960 fathoms of rope, 960 fathoms of rope. Lower away. Right, lower away on your voice now. All that. Five astern, four. Looks like it, Mr. Ellsworth. Pull us down two engines. Pull us down, sir. Stop up. Stop her, sir. Engines are forward, Mr. Ellsworth. Pick up when you're ready. First forward on your hoist. It's not very difficult to hook a cable. The art is to pick it up, and pick it up safely. If they drop the cable now, the whip back of the grappling wire could cut a man in half. So as soon as the cable shows clear on deck, the cable party moves in and stoppers it off. Then they can get to work on it.
when the cable's been cut back to the center conductor, it is tested back to the Shaw terminal station. If the test is good, the cable's buoyed off and dropped overboard. They should be back to pick it up again within 24 hours, if the ice doesn't get there first. If that should happen, the cable ship would have to cut and run. The captain can't risk standing over a cable when there are bergs and growlers about. And that would mean a cable out of action until the ice moved on. Stray cable, the useless bit between the new cut and the original break, is always picked up nowadays. Partly for scrap value, and partly so that it won't cause unnecessary damage to trawler gear. Then they start again. Again, the cable is stripped back to the center conductor. Again, it's tested back, this time to the other end of the cable. But that's only the beginning. A much longer section of cable has got to be stripped back, ready for jointing. And that is going to need patience and skill and time. And time is the one commodity they could run out of. To prepare and joint one piece of cable to another would normally take five or six hours of itself. But now, the pressure's on, and the captain wants the job finished quickly. But it's a job that can't be hurried. The joint must be perfect, and must be seen to be perfect. Then, and only then, can they begin to rebuild the cable. In a factory packed with sophisticated machinery, it's a simple enough process. At sea, it has to be done by hand. And that's another proposition altogether. Now they're just halfway through the repair operation. They still have to relay new cable all the way back to the boy and joint it into their original cut. If they're lucky, a few more hours. If not, it could be weeks before that cable's operational again. As the world demand for food increases, the size and number of the world's fishing vessels will have to increase with it. So will the size and number of the world's submarine cables. Because the more mouths there are to feed in this world, the more tongues there are to speak with, the more voices clamoring to be heard. In some ways, it's fortunate that four-fifths of the Earth's surface is covered by water. Somewhere down there, there is surely room for all of us. After all, it is important that nation shall speak unto nation. I'm sorry, there seems to be some fault on the line. Hold on, and I'll try to reconnect you.